Good evening, Happy New Year. If you desire to address the City Council and the Housing Authority during this meeting, please complete a request to speak form available at the entrance and present it to the City Clerk. Speakers will be called upon at the appropriate time. At this time, I will convene the City Council and the Housing Authority. And our invocation tonight will be given by Pastor John Pettit of the Emmanuel Baptist Temple in Highgrove. And immediately following that, we will have the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you would please stand for the invocation and Pastor Pettit, if you would come forward. Thank you for the invitation. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege we have to meet together and, and to discuss issues that are very important to many people. and. I ask that your wisdom might be granted and given to each member and to each participant here today and that we might uh, be able to find the best solutions to each of the issues that we are discussing today. I pray that your blessings would be upon each of these members, that your, your guidance and your hand, your grace might be with each one. These things we ask in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the pledge to our nation's flag. Thank you, Pastor. May we have roll call, please? Yes, the mayor. Council Member Hussey? Present. Council Member Wilson? I'm here. Council Member Mitchell? Present. Mayor Pro Tem Robles? I'm also here. Mayor McNable? Present. Mayor, you have a quorum? Thank you. First item on our agenda is special presentations, and tonight we do not have any presentations. And as I mentioned, I have adjourned the City Council and the Housing Authority meeting of January 12, 2016, and at this time I will recess the Housing Authority meeting and we will continue on with our City Council meeting. So our next item is the consent calendar. The following consent calendar items are expected to be routine and non-controversial. They will be acted upon by the City Council at one time without discussion. Any council member, staff member, or citizen may request removal of an item from the consent calendar for discussion. At this time, is, are there any requests for removal of consent from my colleagues? Okay, I will entertain a motion if none. I move the consent items. Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion passes five ayes. Council members Hussey, Wilson, Mitchell voted aye. Mayor Pro Tem Robles voted aye. Mayor McNabal voted aye. Thank you. Our next item is public comment. This is the opportunity for members of the public to comment on items not appearing on our regular agenda tonight. Because of the restrictions contained in California law, the City Council may not discuss or act on any item not on the agenda, but may briefly respond to statements made or ask a question for clarification. I may also request a brief response from staff to questions raised during public comment or may request a matter be agendized for a future meeting. Do we have any requests to speak during this time? Thank you. I have a request from Ashley Jones on behalf of Assembly Member Cheryl Brown. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. Happy New Year to all of you. I just have a few brief announcements on behalf of the assembly member, um, as you um, may be aware, Governor Brown released his budget proposal last week. And um, for this year, assembly member Brown's budget priorities include seniors, job growth, business retention, and education funding. So um, if anybody wishes to express their thoughts about the state budget and ask her to advocate on a certain item, please contact us. Our phone number is 909-381. Three two three eight. Um, in addition to that, uh, there's a couple of programs that I have um, would like to announce. 
uh, there is a summer arts program sponsored by the state. Financial aid is um, available and the deadline to apply is February 29th of this year and it is a month-long summer program July 9th through August 5th of this year. And our annual California State Assembly Fellows Program, very valuable experience for college students that will be graduating this June. So if you know anybody that um, would be interested in this program, please um, see me. I have lots of flyers, and I don't want to take them back if possible. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. I appreciate you being here on behalf of the assembly member. Are there any other requests to speak? Okay, is there anybody in the audience wishing to speak at this time? Seeing no takers, I will close public comment and come back to my council colleagues for communication. Their communications. We'll start with Council Member Bill Hussey. Thank you, Mayor. I'll keep this short. We've got a big agenda tonight, but so I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. And uh, thank you, Pat, for delivering the agenda late at night at my doorstep. I appreciate all the hard work you're doing. Um, also, everybody, you know, wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Hope your holidays were blessed. Uh, just a quick thing. I got a call on uh, December 14th, as we all know about the house fire in Grand Terrace. Asked to come over and help board up windows. And what, you know, what really makes Grand Terrace, the word grand, like I always said, is the volunteers that came out that night to help uh, just being there you know we had a the Morales has organized it and uh, we had a uh, Earl Fraser construction donating the plywood and some of his man hours out there we boarded up and we got some items out of the house and when we're all done a uh, local business La Pasta Italian brought over dinner for the the family that night so that's just a great thing the community coming together local businesses coming together to help a family in need during that uh, situation it's a uh, it's a tragic event, especially having a, a fire right around the holidays, too. But I know there's other volunteers that came out and donated clothes and other items. So uh, I'd just like to thank everybody for doing that. It's uh, neighbors helping neighbors. That's what makes the city great. Another thing, um, I know we have somebody from the baseball here, but uh, sign-ups are in full swing. That was over at Pico Park this weekend, Saturday. They start their sign-ups. And... Another thing, another shout out for businesses. I know the community center closed with the Lions Club and and Cal Skate stepping up and having you know opening up their doors for letting in, uh, jazzercise and other events. But like once again, I just want to emphasize you know the businesses taking care of each other here, helping each other out. And that's about all I have. I just want to thank everybody again. I hope they had a happy new year and ready to get this year started. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Next, Council Member Doug Wilson. Thank you, Mayor. I don't have anything this evening. Thanks. All right, thank you, Council Member Jackie Mitchell. I have very little than, other than to thank everyone for coming tonight and participating and wishing everyone a very happy new year. And I look forward to working with my colleagues on a, another successful year for Grand Terrace. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Robles. Um, I have a bit of a lengthy one in there quite important ones um, starting January. It's been a very busy time for all us council people that um, serve on other um, regional bodies. Um, but prior to getting into that discussion, in December, um, we all got an email inviting us to the CART Academy graduation. And I do better at, at night. Jackie Mitchell was kind enough to always get to the 7.30 a.m. meetings for the, for the youth task force. Um, so the graduation was um, the Colton At Risk Teens Academy. Two Grand Terrace youth were graduates, and one was a class valedictorian. I believe his name was Benjamin Jibbs, and I left you um, an article on the on the program. And the other young lady, her, her last name was Angular. Uh, this program is de designed to introduce risk uh, at risk teens to discipline, guidance, and career development. The program is a paramilitary environment that allows students between the ages of 13 and 17 to be exposed to various levels of mentoring, career development, and other topics. The program serves students from the Colton Unified School District. Due to cap staffing constraints, the program was shuttered for five years. Dan Flores, a trustee with the Colton Unified School District, shared with me that they are seeking grants 
and I shared with him um, our grant program. On Amatran's board, we updated the Amatran's Joint Powers Agreement. We adopted a resolution authorizing the CEO to execute certifications and assurances for the fiscal year 1516 Low Carbon Transit Operations Program. We authorized the CAO to execute cooperative service agreements, Riverside Transit Agency, and mutual aid agreements with Victor Valley and Mountain Transit Agencies. We received and filed the SBX Construction Progress Report number 41 for the period ending October 31st. The project budget was 191.7 million. Expended to date is 171.9 million. We had adopted an evaluation tool for the CEO's annual work performance evaluation and I just got that in an email prior to coming here. Um, staff informed the board that annual hearings are being planned to discuss the Amatran's route system. So there's a couple of opportunities with um, the Riverside Transit Agency, them having a cooperative agreement with them and discussing the, the uh, Amatran's route system for Grand Terrace to participate. For example, if we want the Riverside Transit Authority to provide Segway for our high school students, uh, students to use the bus system. So I'll, I'll be keeping us apprised of that. We um, held a closed session on surplus land in the West Valley. We advised staff to reject the current bid and put the property back on the market. The property is commercially zoned and is expected to bring one million in new revenues to the Amatrans General Fund. Um, as the delegate for the Southern California Associated Government SCAG, I attended with um, our city manager, the uh, SCAG Economic Summit in Los Angeles. Former Pete, uh, Governor Pete Wilson was a keynote speaker. He shared the good news that all six Southern California counties have recovered all jobs lost in the recession. Business ranks California 49th uh, with them viewing our regulatory scheme hostile to business and job creation. Um, they view CEQA as an instrument of obstruction. Wilson believes Sacramento makes bad legislation that in fact makes CEQA reform efforts worse than just working with the existing CEQA. He further states our, need, our state needs to produce one million more graduates than we do right now. They had a panel of economists from each of the southern uh, regions, Ventura, Orange, Los Angeles, Imperial, San Diego, and the Inland Empire. All regions have recovered jobs lost in the recessions. The problem is it's not the same jobs that we had prior to the recession. The new jobs are in fast food and other service economy sectors. Legislators recognizing that this sector is the only growing job sector have decided to increase minimum wage levels to try to help the adult worker occupying these jobs once held by teens. The entire panel of economists agreed that this was a futile policy. Businesses are unable to observe the new wage demands and will move to use robots and technology as one way to cut the payrolls. Uh, one economist there had a very sober um, viewpoint for us was that um, we are at the same point that Mexico was in the 1950s. And I've traveled extensively to the interior of Mexico, so people don't realize, they see the border states, they don't re realize that um, Mexico at one time had a strong middle class. Now they have the very, very wealthy and the very, very poor. And that he says that the United States is poised to, to replicate that in this, in, in this country. Um, we, all of us members were, of the council were intended to uh, attend a SCAG briefing on transportation. And this was held at the Sandbag January board meeting. The main points were to move to institute a new gas tax to fund new highways. Current gas saving vehicles has reduced this, current gas saving vehicles has reduced this revenue source. On the horizon is the potential of the driverless car, which have market forces push forward. And this enough where we uh, have enough of the uh, mass, mass transit, excuse me, mass uh, private ownership. This would negate the need to add on one shovel of asphalt to our freeway system. And this kind of overlapped into the SCAG meeting too. So it was um, the policy makers and the government do not know what would be the demand uh, that people would actually go out and buy these driverless cars. So maybe one to, so it says one to 10 years, 
we can have driverless cars on the freeway. If that does, that changes every effort that we are making now to try to, to uh, increase capacity into our, our uh, freeway system. And um, I just want to report, I am a great grandmother now. My grandson was born January 7th. His name's Ezra Marcos Robles. And I was asked um, the mayor if she would endure in memory and my husband's aunt Santos Robles Reese. She was 95 years old, a matriarch of the family, the last one. She was a wonderful person. She adopted two children, one at two years, one at 18 months. And you can imagine when you get children at that age, it's not easy, it's a very difficult task. And she was a step for me, a role model and her life and the family that she left of grandchildren and all that's just a testament of what a good person she was. And I wanna thank you. All right, thank you. Congratulations to you on your birth of your great granddaughter. Son. Son, oh, I'm sorry. All right, well, congratulations on the birth of your great-grandson. And my condolences to your husband on the loss of his aunt and to you on the loss of your mentor. So way back in December, on December 10th, I attended the San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District Advisory Commission on Water Policy. And we had a number of interesting presentations. I'll just keep to the, to the top level of them though. One of them was on the cost of deepening wells. So as our water levels in this region are falling, not only does it mean that we, we don't have the water to use, but it means to get to the water as it's further into the ground is more costly. And that comes in the maintenance of the, mach the machinery needed to actually go down and, and bring that water back up to the surface. So we had a, a presentation on the cost of of the wells and the conditions that they're in at this time. We also had a presentation on groundwater sustainability, the council memorandum of understanding. This particular municipal water district has been very, very focused in the last 20 plus years on making sure that we have groundwater sustainability and working with the, the agencies in the, in the region to make sure that that's true. And they've done a very good job, and especially in the tough times that we've been having with our, with our drought. We looked at proposed revisions to the groundwater basin boundaries under the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And we also looked at a regional recycled water concept study update. This idea of recycled water is different than what many people have know about purple pipe and the, and the recirculation of water. This is actually a a totally different take on using recycled water to, to sustain the groundwater in this region. We also had a Basin Technical Advisory Committee 2016 Regional Water Management Plan update and a Regional Water Management Plan statement. I'm looking forward to our meeting in March where we will see how much of the rain that we're getting now is actually bringing up our, our groundwater in this region. Um, we had some good news from them that you know, if we had some really good, decent rain that in this region, that would help us considerably. So I'm looking forward to seeing what those reports say, considering that I believe we have more rain on the way. Secondly, I attended the Sandbag Metro Valley Study Session on December 10th, and then the General Board Meeting on January 6th. So we looked at everything that uh, Metro Valley Study Session looked at actually was recommended to the board and so it is part of the board report as well. On our consent for administrative matters, we looked at September, October, and November 2015 procurement reports. Also the budget fiscal year 2016-17 assessment dues and that's for all the member agencies. Sandbag fiscal year 2016-17 budget schedule. Our compliance audit for Proposition 1B transit security grant program. Funding request for operation, maintenance, and tenant improvements of the San Bernardino Santa Fe Depot. Sandbag conflict of interest code amendment. Fiscal year 2015-16 work goals and objectives for the first quarter. And the 2016 Sandbag Board of Directors Policy Committee meeting schedule. If any of these are of interest to the public that's listening, they are available on the Sandbag website. And the, it's very detailed in their, in their reports. You get a really good understanding of what this body is doing. 
We also looked at project delivery, MetroLink active transportation program, CEQA environmental approval and authorize release of design request for proposal, award of new program, project management and other technical services contract, con construction management services for the Mana Vista Avenue grade separation project. We also looked at regional and sub-regional planning development of a regional safe routes to school plan for, uh, this is the second phase of that program. Transportation Development Act, Article Three, Phase Two, pedestrian and bicycle facilities, transit stop access improvement call for projects. We also looked at transit rail amendments to a contract with Epic Land Solutions. And this is for additional graffiti removal service. It's amazing how much we as taxpayers through sandbag pay for gra graffiti removal, whether it's along transit rail or any of the projects that we have going on on our highways. Consent calendar also for transportation programming and fund management, a summary of measure I capital improvement plan of member agencies. And that is the, the plans that each of the cities that are part of this sandbag body, what improvement plans they have for use of their measure I capital improvement portions. Loan concept for Green Tree Boulevard in Victorville, amendment of Victor Valley major local highway program policy, major local highway program sub area projects list for the Colorado River and mountain sub areas, allocation to Park Boulevard reconstruction project and project funding agreement, and then also the fiscal year 2015 16 low carbon transit operations program and the population share. Our discussion items, and these are items that that are not passed in one single vote. We had a hearing to consider resolutions of necessity for parcels for Interstate 215 Barton Road interchange improvement project in the city of Grand Terrace. That is an eminent domain hearing. There are a number of parcels that they are working to purchase for right of way or for construction easement. And we've been seeing a considerable amount of the resolutions for necessity for these parcels coming to Sandbag. The financial advisor services for I-10 and I-15 corridor projects, they're looking at having a, an assessment done that would be for financial investment in these corridor projects if they do. This is um, the idea of HOV lanes and also express lanes. Construction contract for the I-10 Pepper Avenue bridge replacement project, status, status of sandbag financial audit, and the state legislative update end of session report. And lastly, just um, was left on the dais for us today. There's a news release from the Superior Court of California. Applications are now being accepted for the 2016, 2017 San Bernardino County Grand Jury. If this is something that you're interested in, you can go to the San Bernardino County website, www.sbccounty.gov slash grand jury, and you can apply there online, or there's a phone number to call, 909-387-9120. Applications are being accepted through February 29th. And Happy New Year to you all. That ends my report. We will move into our next item, which is a public hearing. So to speak on the public hearing items, please fill out a request to speak form and give it to the city clerk. Each person will be allowed three minutes to address the city council. If you challenge in court any action taken concerning a public hearing item, you may be limited to raising only those issues that you or someone else raised at the public hearing, described in this notice or in written correspondence delivered to the city at or prior to the public hearing. And to date, I have no written correspondence on this item. We are looking at a zoning code amendment, 15-04, relocating and amending the existing prohibition of marijuana dispensaries to the zoning code, an amendment to chapter 5.90 to title five, prohibiting issuance of a business license for medical marijuana dispensaries. So I will at this time open the public hearing if we could have a staff report, please. Yes, Madam Mayor. Um, from our law offices, we have um, Ivy Sai and uh, G. Ross Trindle to provide that presentation. Uh, 
Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, I'm Ross Trindle. I'm from the City Attorney's Office. And uh, in October of last year, uh, three bills were passed in the state legislature that sought to enact a comprehensive regulatory scheme uh, related to medical marijuana and mer medical marijuana uh, industries. Uh, it was kind of a last minute uh, rush through to get everything done. And in one of the bills, there was a, a certain clause with respect to uh, localities having to pass uh, some type of regulatory scheme or a prohibition on specifically on the cultivation of marijuana in order to retain local control. Uh, the issue of local control was very important to many of the stakeholders and the League of California Cities, the California Police Chiefs Association, and a number of other groups uh, lobbied very hard to maintain local control so that local jurisdictions can enact regulations that fit their community based on the input uh, of their residents. Uh, unfortunately, this one provision in AB 243 related to cultivation set a deadline of March 1st, 2016 for any type of regulatory scheme or prohibition on the cultivation of marijuana uh, had to be in effect uh, or the state would come in and be the sole licensing entity. In other words, the, the state would have the, the control uh, to issue licenses within this jurisdiction or uh, other local jurisdictions. So with that deadline set, uh, we prepared the uh, process for the, a zoning uh, ordinance to go through the planning commission to come to the, uh, the, to the city council specifically for the measure uh, that's on the agenda. What this does is it uh, puts a specific prohibition for the issuance of, of business licenses related to me uh, medical marijuana. It also moves the current prohibition into the zoning code. That was a legal uh, decision that was made because the, the cases that have come out with respect to the regulation of medical marijuana rely upon a city's uh, power to control its zoning. Uh, so we felt to provide the best uh, measure of protection for the city, it would be wise to, to make sure that that prohibition comes through uh, in the zoning code and then we uh, have the attendant uh, restriction on the issuance of business license. Uh, the specifics are in your uh, agenda packets uh, and at this point I can answer any questions that you might have. Do council have any technical questions at this time? Okay. Seeing none, I will... Um, Go ahead and open public comment on this item. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our first request to speak is from Patricia Taylor. Do we have a handheld microphone that? Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm Patsy Taylor, Grand Terrace. I have MS. I've had MS since the 1980s. There is no cure for MS. I don't want to end up in a wheelchair. I eat right, I exercise, and I use medical marijuana to help me cope with my depressing disease. I have it delivered to my home. Please don't take my medicine away from me. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Yeah. Our second request to speak is Judy H. Hello, <laughs> I'm Judy, and I lived in Grand Terrace for 10 years. I have brain cancer. I've been fighting it for about six to seven years. To, as of today, my doctors did not think I would live this long with a other crisis of cancer. I don't know what's in store for me for tomorrow if all these law passes. I do know my medical marijuana has helped me survive long enough so I can stand here and talk to you. It's still very overwhelming for me. As you know, my medicine has helped me insanely about helping, helping me with the disease and not getting depressed. And it, 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 
the treatments they force on them what I have to wear, what I have to endure. If you take away my medicine, that will be the death for me. Because I don't have my medicine, I will have a death sentence on me. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Judy. And Mr. Jeffrey McConnell. This is a hand I just received today. Um, my name is Jeffrey McConnell. I am not a medical marijuana patient. I am Patsy's caregiver for the last 10 years, though. I spoke at the Planning Commission meeting, and I, um, having been involved with Patricia, Patsy, I'm familiar with some of the uh, stuff in this grassroots movement, grassroots movement regarding uh, medical marijuana for the last 10 years. <clears throat> and um, they have their own attorneys, that, and that's their specialty. And apparently this thing that's going on before us tonight is going across many communities, municipalities in the state of California. And it's no surprise to me that it's being rushed through, because according to this, it's, um, Monsanto is behind some of this. And if you know, familiar with Monsanto, they have their um, hands in the pockets of many politicians across the nation, including the, the head of the FDA is the ex-vice president of Monsanto and corporate lobbyist uh, Robert Taylor. But in any case, I got this from an attorney, uh, Letitia um, Peppers, and she, the main point that they're trying to say here is the Agricultural Code 52334 invalidates any medical marijuana cultivation ordinance adopted without prior written consent of the Secretary of Agriculture. Apparently, that's going to be the legal issue in the whole thing. Now, I'm not here to argue about uh, for-profit cultivation, for-profit dispensaries or anything like that. That's not, I'm not here. This is for real patients. And I'm not talking about 14-year-olds that, you know, pay the $35 and get a slip to say that their wrist hurts or something. This is about the true patients. And a lot of these people that are behind this movement is strictly for the true patients. And they're hoping that the price comes down so that the true patients can afford this. So I want you to refer to this handout and speak with your attorney if he is uh, familiar with this point about the uh, Agriculture Code Section 52234. And, um, and I know we can't regulate Monsanto from here. I understand that. I understand we can't override the state. But this is going to be an ongoing issue. It will come back before us again, I'm sure. What I told the Planning Commission, I'm just hoping that we don't have to end up in a, a lawsuit <clears throat> expensive lawsuit that we can't afford. So I'm sure I would hope that the attorney stays in contact with what's going on in all the other municipalities on a uh, statewide level as far as the, uh, the battle that is brewing. So um, I don't know to what degree you can do. Like I said, it's being rushed through. That's another tactic of Monsanto. If you're familiar with them, they want to control everything you consume on this planet. I got 37 seconds left, so I will say that uh, on Earth Day 2016, there are a multitude of countries, the United States excluded, that is suing Monsanto in international court in Nuremberg, Germany, for uh, crimes against humanity for their pesticides that are killing the honeybees. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McConnell. Mr. Trendle, did you want to address the issues that were raised? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor. The, this issue has come up uh, in, in uh, speaking with colleagues uh, of mine throughout the state. Uh, we are aware of this provision. Uh, in, in our kind of collective opinion, you have a situation where a general statute is uh, 
enacted here in the Agricultural Code, but you have a specific and comprehensive statutory scheme that's been enacted via the Medical Marijuana and Regulation, uh, Regulation Safety Act. Uh, in that situation, the law provides that specific uh, provisions of law control over general provisions of law. So in this particular situation, the general ban set forth in Food and Agricultural Code 52334 uh, would give way to the comprehensive regulatory scheme that's been set forth in the Medical Marijuana Regulation and Safety Act. Uh, something that I also didn't mention before in my initial presentation is that the, the primary reason for these anti-cultivation ordinances, at least in, at this point in time, is to maintain local control. This does not plant a, a, an immovable point uh, for this council. It gives the council an opportunity to, to interface with the community and to come up with the best set of regulations, whether that be a prohibition or whether that be some type of, of a permissive regulatory scheme. But the, the urgency was so that local control could stay here and not be ceded to the state and to allow the development of whatever statutory scheme is best for Grand Terrace over time. And what remedy do medical marijuana patients have with respect to this? With respect to? Being able to receive their medical marijuana as they currently do. Right now, the, the current de uh, definition includes uh, delivery services that would be covered under, under the ban. That includes delivery into, that includes delivery uh, businesses that originate here and deliver out. Uh, that does not include the transport through the city. That's something that we, we aren't able to regulate. So at this point, uh, anyone who's living within the city would have to go to another jurisdiction where it's permitted. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from my colleagues? Mayor Pro Tem? Go ahead. Well, yeah. Um, I've been following this, and I attended a, a, a league division meeting where we were on call with the lobbyists in Sacramento. Uh, for example, I have a granddaughter who has epilepsy. So, you know, I brought that up, and apparently there was a, a, a strong funder of activities in Sacramento, you know, a, a contributor to political campaigns who our lobbyist told us was, also has an epileptic daughter. You know, so we shared with, with um, my colleagues there that the, um, the, the uh, medical marijuana that treats epilepsy doesn't have any uh, carbonoids in it. So, you know, there wouldn't be any uh, uh, recreational benefit to it. There's no high in it. So, but also um, watching this is that I'm also aware that um, we're not really where we need to be um, to, to feel kind of comfortable with um, that there is, you know, the, the, there are a lot of people are being given um, um, medical cards, you know, who do we really know if they, you know, they're, they're, you know, what the legitimacy of it is, I don't know. But I am concerned hearing if we have someone with MS, and I know how this, this treats it, or people that are in um, uh, end st life stage and their comfort. So we're saying that we're going to ban even them getting delivery to their home of something they have a prescription for? To, to clarify, they have a recommendation. They don't have a prescription okay. uh, for it. I, I know that that may seem semantic, but, um, semantical, but okay. that's something that's going to be coming forward as a legal issue uh, as this, this area of the law continues to evolve. But as the definition currently is set, yes, it includes delivery services. Okay, so you're saying, because this is new to me, so you're saying that's not recognized as prescription. It's only recognized as a recommendation. That's correct. Okay, so that's, a, that's a new for me. Well, I would just say from the policy standpoint, at some point, as this goes through its machinations, we're going to have to be faced with if it's going to be legal and if there is legitimate medical use and um, all jurisdictions can't say we're not going to have it, or can we? I mean, what, you know, so there, there's going to be at some point between public policy, uh, we got to weigh also legitimate needs of, of, of folks. And what I see right now is, is we're not quite there. Are we, are we entertaining in, in the horizon as this legitimizes, quote unquote, where we're going to be on our, in our uh, zoning or uh, allowed uses? 
Again, the, the primary reason for the presentation of this ordinance was so that the city can maintain control over this area without ceding it to the state. As of the beginning of January, there was an assembly member out of the second district, uh, assembly member Woods, who issued a letter uh, that was entered into the Legislative Digest, which is the official record of, of the legislature, indicating his intention to do a cleanup bill which would remove the deadline. As of now, I haven't seen anything further uh, on that issue. So we, the city was in a position of m taking a gamble that maybe the legislature would move on the issue in time to meet the March deadline. Um, we counseled caution in saying, even if the situation arises where you do want to enact some type of regulatory scheme, you will need to maintain local control first. Right. And that's really the primary purpose of this ordinance. And that's the, the same type of advice we've been providing to other clients. Wherever they fall on the spectrum of where they anticipate their regulatory scheme is going to fall, if you don't have local control, your hands will be tied in the future. And that's, that's, where, uh, that's where this is primarily coming from. Right. And that when, when actually when I was in that meeting with the, the league, um, that was being crafted out. Uh, you know, the, the different models of was it going to be the ABC, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, yes, I do understand. Um, and to clarify for the public, what we're doing here is making sure we have, as a city, local control using our police powers, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so then all these other items, um, as far as the regulatory scheme, are still evolving, and we may evolve with that depending on what the council chooses to do. Yes, th mm -hmm. this does not pin down the, the council at all it, in its discretion as a policy-making body. It, it absolutely can come up with regulations that it, it, it sees fit. In terms of where this is going, it's very uncertain. The mm -hmm. issue is outstanding with respect to federal law and how uh, the federal government's enforcement posture may or may not change uh, come the election. Also, there's the question of recently uh, a past uh, qualified uh, ballot initiative uh, that has significant funding that we're watching to see what impact that might have uh, on the ability of local governments to uh, maintain some form of local control. So yes, the, the issue very much is uh, uh, evolving. Yeah, and then so this weird scheme of things, I'm sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna interrupt you here, Mayor Pro Tem, our well, city no, attorney wanted important. to. This is, I'm just gonna, so then the, she can go to another jurisdiction and pick up her prescription and bring it to her home. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Madam Mayor and uh, members of the council, if I may add to Mr. Trindle's comments, our current co code already prohibits dispensaries. That is not a change. The only, the change is we're, we're relocating it to the zoning code and we are clarifying also that cultivation is prohibited. And so it, it really isn't that much of a big change from where we currently are. And this is so that we, again, as Mr. Trindle stated, so we can retain local control and as part of your action or direction tonight, you might direct staff to look into this further. And I know I inter interrupted you, so I want to come back and make sure that you were able to finish with your questions. Yeah, um, yeah I understand what we're doing here. So I just wanted to make sure as far as, far as I mean, I'm sure you, this, 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 this is a double-edged sword, and I'm just having a dialogue on, 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 on the consequences of what we're doing and why we're doing it. We have to be very, very careful. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, Council Member Mitchell. I, I have a question which you may or may not know. What jurisdictions border Grand Terrace that permit delivery? That permit delivery? Yes. I believe the city of Riverside does not, the city of Colton does not. In fact, I know they don't because I wrote their ordinance and I've enforced on their behalf. Uh, the city of San Bernardino has uh, a ban that, because of their financial situation, they've had a lot of difficulty in enforcing. Uh, and I believe that both the county of Riverside and the county of San Bernardino uh, do not uh, allow it. I, beyond that, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close public comment and the rebuttal portion and bring it back to council for deliberation and consideration of motion. Madam Mayor, I move for approval on the side. Okay. A second. Okay, so we are uh, uh, first, or uh, motion and second on um, the recommendation by staff, and then we will have a read by title only by our city clerk. 
An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Grand Terrace to amend the Grand Terrace Municipal Code by adding Chapter 5.9 to Title 5, prohibiting issuance of business license for medical marijuana dispensaries and rechaptering and amendment of Chapter 9.28 of Title 9 to newly created Chapter 18.91 of Title 18 to preserve local authority to regulate and prohibit medical marijuana dispensaries and cultivation. Thank you. A motion and second, please vote. Motion passes, five ayes. Council members Hussey, Wilson, Mitchell voted aye. Mayor Pro Tem Robles voted aye. Mayor McNabo voted aye. Thank you. We'll move to the next item, which is unfinished business, is our truck route ordinance. This is a second reading, so we do not have a staff report. Madam Clerk, do we have any requests to speak on this item? Thank you. Mr. Jeffrey McConnell. We're on the truck route ordinance. Thank you, Jeffrey McConnell, Walnut Avenue. Uh, as this has come many times before the Planning Commission, the topic. Uh, the the council and the planning commission for our neighborhood over there on the west of the freeway. The big rigs constantly, and they still do, get lost in our neighborhood. And uh, during Joyce Power's tenure, we finally got one sign, but it's not very big. And the um, trucks still wander through our neighborhood, and they're tearing up the roads. Our roads over there are 100 year old. Actually, I'm working with Isaac, Council Member Isaac Sulcher right now. There's a sinkhole over there on Terrace Avenue. It's about four inches deep right now. Uh, <clears throat> but it's, um, so what I'm asking for is really is, is to um, notify the businesses over there, especially specifically where I live, uh, West Coast Arborists and CLS to make sure that they go up Terrace Avenue, which is not on your route, but they have no choice. They have to get to the route. But they have uh, the big heavy trucks with the cherry pickers and, and the large equipment and whatnot. Uh, and sometimes they go through um, past my house, past Bobby's house on Burns, and then past Ed's and Becky's house over on Vivienda for whatever reasons. So I would appreciate if this is, no they're notifying of, um, of this ordinance that they take Terrace Avenue, number one. And number two, can we get some bigger, more noticeable signage? And I'll, I'll work with whoever, and because I, I have a relationship with Isaac Suchel, um, other than political. And to, because the Terrace Avenue, Barton Road is actually in Colton. So um, I would like to uh, work with it any parties to be. I mean, if my neighborhood knew this was on the agenda, there'd be more people here because this is a constant problem. And if you're familiar with our little neighborhood that runs along the terrace there on Vivian Avenue, there's, um, there's constant damage to the slope from the vibration. El Nino is probably gonna cost some more. We've had some costly expense a couple years back when Mr. Stankowitz was uh, mayor and uh, because of the rains and uh, failure of uh, roads. <clears throat> um, so uh, that's all I asked for, is that we try and get some more signage to keep what few trucks still go through our neighborhood, big rigs. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McConnell. I have no other request to speak forms. Is there someone else that would like to speak on this item? Seeing no takers, I'll close public comment and bring it back to council for any further discussion and consideration of a motion. Madam Mayor, I move approval of uh, item number five, agenda item number five, the truck route ordinance. Okay. I'll second that motion. Okay, I have a motion and second. Can we read by title, please? Yes, ma'am. Hmm. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Grand Terrace, County of San Bernardino, State of California, amending chapter 10.04 of Title 10 of the Grand Terrace Municipal Code by relocating and renumbering Article 10 violations in its entirety as Article 11 and replacing Article 10 in its entirety with a new Article 10 entitled Designated Truck Route. 
Thank you. There's a motion and second. Please vote. Motion passes five ayes. Council members Hussey, Wilson, Mitchell voted aye. Mayor Pro Tem Dolis voted aye. Mayor McNabo voted aye. Thank you. We'll move to new business. Item six is the award of a January 2016 Community Benefit Fund to the Grand Terrace Little League. Is there a staff report with this? Thank you. Uh, good evening. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Council Members. My name is Cynthia Fortune and I'm from the Finance Department. This staff report supports the following City Council goals. Goal number one, ensuring our fiscal viability through the continuous monitoring of revenue receipts and expenditure disbursements against approved budget appropriations. And goal number four, develop and, developing and implementing successful partnerships through productive collaborations with community groups, youth programs, and senior organizations. On June 23, 2015, City Council approved the use of $25,000 from the City's general fund reserve balance to establish a community benefits fund. This fund's purpose was to provide funding for local youth programs, community events, community fee waivers, and to be used as an economic development tool for small business development in the City. Uh, at the beginning of this month, uh, the City received an application from the Grand Terrace Little League. The Grand Terrace Little League is a league dedicated to the love of the game while having fun learning. Baseball and softball programs are provided for players of various age levels and abilities to ins ensure a fair, positive, and enriching experience. Um, the application that the Grand Terrace Little League submitted was for uh, equipment. Uh, the activity was to aid in the purchase of baseball and softball equipment for the 2016 season, and they were requesting an amount of $2,000. The Community Benefits Guideline criteria states, to qualify, the grant application must be for the furtherance of a public purpose benefiting the city. The organization must be located within or offer a project within the city of Grand Terrace. Applications must have a focus on the city of Grand Terrace's local communities and the, the applicant must have no outstanding debts to the City of Grand Terrace, and the activity must take place before the end of the current fiscal year. Um, the, uh, after review of the application, uh, staff has determined that the Little League does qualify. Um, the League promotes community involvement and participation, providing teamwork, good sportsmanship, development of a positive sense of self-esteem, while protecting the children by keeping them involved in sports. Um, page three also states that the grants are provided to schools and community organizations to carry out a municipal purpose while improving the people's quality of life. It also states that proposals uh, place a high priority on youth programs and community events. So based on the guidelines and the application that was submitted, staff is recommending that City Council approve the award of $2,000 to the city's community benefit fund. And as shown in the staff report on the fiscal impact statement, um, we provide the balance should this application be approved. Thank uh, you. That finishes my report. Thank you. Any questions of staff? Okay. Are there any requests to speak on this item? Thank you for your report. One request from Robert Bond. Hello, Mayor, City Council, Happy New Year. Uh, I just wanted to touch on the subject to, uh, on behalf of our league and board members uh, and president uh, this year, Mark Severson, to let you guys know we're just not asking this money just because it's out there. Um, every year we take into consideration as you guys do what uh, our players and parents are requesting and, and uh, we take that into consideration for the following year. Uh, we make changes every year and we learn from previous years to make things better. One of the things that was brought to our attention was why do we have such a short season? Um, so we took into consideration we added six weeks to our schedule for more games played for our kids. Uh, this obviously has added increased fees in our league with that, uh, lighting fees, umpire fees, things like that, uh, that we are incurring. We've also, uh, in the boundaries of Grand Terrace Little League, we've now acquired portions of Loma Linda uh, because they have no Little League. 
We have also put in a boundary to extend our area to the new area up in the Pigeon Pass area and a portion of High Grove in the back over there where the majority of the kids already play in our league. Uh, if that happens, we are looking at a minimum increase of 100 plus kids in our league. We don't know yet how that's going to work, but uh, from Loma Linda in itself, that's probably going to be about 100 kids. Uh, half of the other Loma Linda on the other side of the freeway that the boundaries were divided in are going to uh, Ken Hubs. So it's not an impact of uh, just one city taking it all on. Um, we have the lowest rate of sign up fees. Uh, with the youth groups in Grand Terrace. Basketball is about 120, what I was told. Soccer, 150, and football is 300 plus. We're at $90 and $65 for the lower division kids that uh, we don't have to provide as be better uniforms for them. Uh, an issue that was uh, surprisingly increased to us this year was charter fees that we had to pay to Little League International. That increased by $1,500. Uh, insurance also went up that we paid to Grand Terrace uh, or to uh, Little League International by 35% approximately. Uh, we also give scholarships out to the kids and the less fortunate that aren't able to come up with the money. Uh, we pick up that tab and, and pay for them because we do not uh, turn any kid away. We allow everybody to play. Um, so with that being said, these fees have significantly increased more than the $2,000 this year. We have looked at things to uh, rectify that as far as fu other fundraisers beyond our norm. Uh, with a softball tournament type thing and uh, next year as we come up we're going to learn this year where we can what we can do as fundraisers within our own league to accommodate that but this uh, this uh, money right here that uh, we're asking for would uh, significantly help out this year so thank you for your time thank, thank you. you for your comments and are there any any others that would like to speak on this item okay seeing none I'll close public comment and bring it back to my colleagues for deliberation and consideration of a motion. And Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to approve the award of $2,000 to the from the City Community Benefit Fund to for Grand Terrace Little League. I'll second that. Okay, there's been a motion and second. Any further discussion? Please vote. Motion passes five ayes. Council members Hussey, Wilson, Mitchell voted aye. Mayor Pro Tem Robles voted aye. Mayor Macdabo voted aye. Thank you. We'll move to our next item, which is the approval of contractor agreement between the City of Grand Terrace and Clean Street for street sweeping services. May we have staff report, please? Good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council. Adrian Freeman, Management Analyst with the Community Development Department. This staff, staff report supports goal number two, maintain public safety by investing in critical improvements to infrastructure. On September 22, 2015, the City Council authorized an emergency uh, purchase order for the continued citywide street sweeping service through the end of February 20, uh, 2016. At that time, staff informed council that a formal bid would be issued by the end of 2015 and that by the end of February 2016, the city would have a new contract agreement for street sweeping services. On October 29, 2015, uh, a notice inviting bids was issued. Uh, it was advertised on the city website and it was also emailed to various street sweeping companies. Uh, three bids were received uh, by the due date of November 18th, and the city clerk conducted the bid opening, which was witnessed by the management analyst and the city manager. Of the three bids received, two were de determined to be responsive. That was Clean Street and Pacific Sweeping. Of the two responsive bids, Clean Street was the lowest resp responsive bidder. <clears throat> Excuse me. Keller Sweeping responded with the lowest bid, but they were not responsive in that they did not meet the requirements of the bid to provide three municipal references and acknowledge the receipt of the bid addendum. At this time, staff is recommending that City Council do the following. First, reject the bid from Keller Sweeping as non-responsive. Secondly, award the street sweeping contractor agreement to Clean Street, which will begin March 1st, through February 28, 2018, 
for an amount not to exceed $58,000 annually. Thirdly, authorize the city manager to execute the agreement. And lastly, authorize an appropriation from the gas tax fund balance in the amount of $10,000 to the street sweeping services account. At this time, should council have any questions, uh, staff is more than willing to, to answer. Thank you. Does staff have any technical questions of staff at this time? I have one question for you. Yes. As we are looking at um, street sweeping, I know I have residents that wonder why it is that we sweep the streets. Could you give a little bit of uh, background on why it's something that we do and why we couldn't just save money by, by not doing it? I can defer to our community <laughs> development director. Thank you. Yes, Madam Mayor, Madam Mayor, members of the council. The city is required to um, ensure that uh, we comply with the National Pollution Elimination Discharge System. And so we do have uh, federal requirements that come down to the state and then to the county level. Essentially, we need to ensure that um, we uh, monitor and limit um, debris and pollutions that could enter into our stormwater system. And so uh, we do street, uh, sweep the streets on a regular basis to pick up all that debris that uh, accumulates in our gutter system. And what would the residents notice if we just didn't do it? Well, they would notice um, over time the accumulation of dirt and debris um, in, in, our, in our gutters and in the streets in proximity to that gutter. You know, um, windy days, you get leaves, you get uh, s small branches, um, you get uh, sometimes, you know, folks do empty out their car and sometimes aren't so diligent about putting that in the trash can. So over time, what happens is you will get trash, leaves, debris um, in, our, in, our, in our gutters. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate the co those comments. And um, if we have no more questions of staff at this time, I'll open public comment. Do we have any request to speak forms? Nope. Okay, is there anyone here wishing to speak on this item? Seeing no takers, I will close public comment and bring it back to council for discussion and a motion. I'll move the item. I'll second that. Okay, there's a motion and second. Any further discussion? Okay, please vote. Motion passes five ayes. Council members Hussey Wilson Mitchell voted aye. Mayor Pro Tem Robles voted aye. Mayor McNumber voted aye. Okay, thank you. We'll move to item eight, which is approved funding agreement and lease agreement with Valley Transportation Service or VTRANS for Grand Terra Senior Transportation Program. May we have a staff report, please? Again, uh, thank you, Honorable Mayor and City Council. For the record, Adrian Freeman, Management Analyst, Community Development Department. Um, here to discuss the Senior Transportation Program. The staff report supports the 2030 Vision Goal Number Four: Develop and Implement Successful Partnerships. On October 17, 2015, the City Council approve the use of one-time money from the 2014-2015 fiscal year operating budget to fund a number of quality of life enhancement projects. Council actions included the allocation of $15,000 to implement a senior bus program. The Grand Terra Senior Center provides a full spectrum of services and activities, uh, including a senior, senior nutri nutrition program uh, where they provide uh, lunch uh, Monday through Friday. Uh, the Family Services Association does so. And uh, we have found that the Senior Center and the Senior Nutrition Program are underutilized. Uh, and it is be the belief of staff that, in part, lack of transportation is a significant contributing factor uh, to the underutilization of those services. The proposed program, uh, senior bus program, will be five days a week. Uh, each ride will be 50 cents per passenger. Uh, that would be uh, just to mention by donation. Uh, and include trips to and from the senior center. 
uh, annual excursions. The Senior Center has an annual excursion, and so that would be included. And the hope is that we would be able to uh, grow the program to include uh, trips to doctor's appointments and uh, even the grocery store. The City of Grand Terrace, as mentioned, has budgeted $15,000, and uh, you'll see in the fiscal impact portion how that is uh, broken down. Uh, so it will actually uh, be $15,000 over three years. Um, and this is in an effort to establish the senior uh, bus program. To supplement uh, the contribution from the city, uh, we did seek partnership with Valley Transportation Services, also known as VTrans. Uh, this is a 501c3 nonprofit that was created and designated by Sandbag to receive 2% of Measure I fundings uh, that are earmarked for senior and disabled funds, or senior and disabled programs, excuse me, uh, using the funds that are collected uh, in the valley portion of San Bernardino. On December 16th, 2015, uh, the VTrans board did approve the funding agreement and the leasing agreement uh, for the Grand Terrace Senior Transportation Program. Uh, VTrans also has a vehicle that they are willing to lease to the city for $1 a year. Um, and I actually have an example here of what that vehicle would look like. A 2006 Ford E450. Um, and on the other side, uh, there was basically two entry points, um, one of which is wheelchair accessibility, uh, a wheelchair ramp, rather, um, for those who um, or disabled. Discussion of the budget, this is just uh, an overview for you. As I discussed uh, earlier, Grand Terrace would be setting aside $45,000 over three years uh, for this program. But do please uh, note the VTrans match, uh, which would total $132,000, uh, almost $133,000 uh, over three years. And then we did include as well um, the, uh, basically the um, fees that the passengers would pay. Um, and of course, uh, that would be by donation. Um, but if all passengers were to pay, it would be $7,200 over three years. So next steps. Uh, following this, we will also need an approval of a new classification of a bus driver. We will need to recruit a bus driver. Um, then we will also secure the VTrans bus. It will be ready for us uh, by the end of this month. Um, we will also pursue marketing and outreach in various forms using social media partnerships, um, radio announcements, um, the full spectrum of marketing and outreach. And then we will also set up an extension in the City Hall phone directory uh, whereby uh, residents can call in and schedule uh, or make reservations uh, to be picked up. So at this time, staff is recommending uh, that Council approve the leasing agreement and funding agreement uh, with or between the City and VTrans uh, for Senior Transportation Program. If you have any questions, we'd be more than willing to answer. Um, Council Member Hussey. Um, you said that the, the store, the local grocery store and the doctors were still waiting to approve that because I remember the mayor mentioned that and that would be, she mentioned a good point a while back, you know, having the seniors go to, you know, drop off point in the front of the store instead of the Omnitrans at the bus stop and that's part of the uh, nutrition program. I like to see that push, you know, forward, but is that just on the back burner or is that part of the program right now? That's, that's something that we would actually look to implement. So as we, we're, what we're doing is we're kind of scaling in the program. So we're starting with the senior center, the annual excursion, and then incorporating uh, the other services. Okay, uh, I just, you know, personal opinion, I just like to see that, you know, because a lot of the seniors can't get out and buy their food or they, you know, it's a little bit of a walk, like the mayor said, from uh, the bus stop. So that was just my concern. Thank you. Any other questions of staff? Councilmember Mitchell. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have three, three questions. What is the, the possible 
risk or liability to the city if a passenger gets injured or something else happens on the bus? What the sort of liability, or who assumes the liability? Excuse me, um, <clears throat> Councilmember Mitchell. That's um, the city self-insured through the Joint Powers Insurance Authority, and so we would be self-insured. Can you? Is this working? Yeah. Okay. Yes. This is so. not working. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, Joint Powers Insurance Authority, we're self-insured through that authority. We, we did provide a documentation also to be trans of our uh, insurance uh, policies. Okay. Uh, Madam Mayor and the uh, members of the council, each agreement contains a mutual indemnity clause, so we are each responsible for our own acts and, and omissions. So, um, so, but when does the city assume that and when does V trans, like, well, I guess where I'm, I'm need a little more clarity. I guess how does that work? If if there was an incident, there could be multiple parties considered at fault. It could be the person who's injured themselves if they fail to uh, guard against negligence. It could be the driver, um, and it it could be alleged to be the city's. So uh, depending on um, what the allegations, you know, we're talking hypotheticals here, but depending on who is alleged to be at fault, we would, that, that, per, that party would, would um, need to either take responsibility or prove that they're not responsible. It's really hard to speak about hypotheticals in sure. this situation. Yeah. I just, I, I attended an Omnitrans meeting and I know that they're upgrading their busing system to, um, better provide uh, safety measures for some of their, their passengers that included um, upgraded wheelchair access and, and um, harness type things. And I, I would imagine this bus is not gonna come equipped with those sorts of things. But I'm, I'm just thinking now, are we gonna be limited on um, the type of passengers that we carry or? So let me, let me just jump in here. For the record, G. Harold Duffy, uh, the city manager. Um, part of the process of securing uh, the right transportation with VTrans was to, they took the bus in and they, they supposedly have made all of the retrofits that are necessary. In addition to that, um, Omnitrans uh, will actually be taking over that, over the VTrans role in the near future. And one of the things when we had our presentation from Omnitrans is they said that, that in other organizations, when they bring in new buses, they, they then transfer the older buses to organizations like our program. So but we can certainly make sure, and I, I would, I would, I'm very comfortable in saying this, that the existing bus that Omnitrans is going to be leasing, uh, that we'll be leasing from them, will meet all of, this, of, this, of the standards. Uh, we currently have a bus right now for our child care program that doesn't have uh, wheelchair accessibility. So that, that didn't allow us to incorporate that into to this program. One of the important components of this program was being able to provide services for all seniors of all types. So this, this should meet all the requirements, and we'll go back and, and make that uh, very clear. And in terms of uh, operations, uh, the city, through its being self-insured as the operator, will assume the responsibility, but there are a number of things in which the city and the city driver has to go through to ensure that there is a safe driver operating uh, program. Sure. Okay. Just Thank a couple you, more Mr. questions. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, did you see? Transaction. Um, so the operating hours of the bus, and then um, like uh, methods of payment, the transactions. How do how will those occur? Will they be prepaid tickets? Um, you said I, I believe you said a donation of fifty cents. Right. The so, um, oh, I'm sorry. Talk about that don that transaction of the donation. Sure. Where the hours I believe are set as 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. for now, and that's why we okay. said the phasing in uh, that covers the lunch hour at the senior center, so they can go have their lunch, mingle for a while, socialize for a while, and then have a ride back home. Um, so that's the hours as established now. Uh, in terms of payment, uh, that is a server or a process rather that. Uh, we can set up on the city side of how funds will be received. Um, so that would, that would be actually on, on our end to determine that. Our overall process really is to try to create a program where uh, 
the, the funding associated with this program is for a full-time bus driver. So the overall goal is to do morning pickup, drop off, and coordinate with the senior center for their activities, and then do the, so they're there the most of the day, they have lunch, and at the end of the day, they're then delivered back home to, the, to their address. And so we can expand those hours as we become more, more efficient in terms of number of activities and so on and so on. And the transaction, I believe, in addition to having the pay by service, what our overall goal would be is to have people sign up for blocks. Mm -hmm. So if you sign up for a month and a, a donation of 50 cents for a round trip, so then you would end up, we'd be able to have you on our schedule to, be, to coordinate, you, you know which time we're gonna be there. So, we're, and obviously this is our first year, and so we'll, we'll get better and more efficient as we continue with the program. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. And Council Member Mitchell, you have another question? No, I was just curious. I guess somehow I missed the, the operating hours. It's, it, it, I'm sure it's in here somewhere. Just wanted to, I, I see that the center is, the operating center for this, hours for the center and such. Um, okay, I guess if, I'm just curious to the other questions that I asked. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any other questions, staff? Okay, my only concern, and I shared this with the city manager already, is the dates on the contract, and, and I hope that they will change accordingly. Okay. All right. Um, if that's all the council questions at this time, I'll open to public comment. Are there any requests to speak forms? No? Okay. And I don't see anybody motioning that they want to speak, so I'll close public comment and come back to council for discussion and consideration of motion. Motion for approval, Mayor. I'll second. Okay. I have a motion and second. Please vote. Motion passes five ayes. Council members Hussey, Wilson, Mitchell voted aye. Mayor Pro Tem Robles voted aye. Mayor McNamble voted aye. Okay, thank you. We'll move to item nine, which is the adoption of a resolution declaring the city's intent to participate in the National Flood Insurance Program, adopting an urgency ordinance and introduce a second ordinance amending Title 15, establishing Chapter 15.62 Floodplain Management. May we have a staff report, please? Yes, good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. My name is Sandra Molina. I am your community development director. I'm not sure what happened to my PowerPoint presentation. This item does promote our 2030 vision with respect to our city's mission to preserve and protect our community and its exceptional quality of life throughout, of life through thoughtful planning within the constraints of physically, fiscally responsible government. As the mayor indicated that this item is um, a proposal to establish a floodplain management ordinance. And as, as the council may recall, over the last month or so, there's been a number of residents that have expressed concern with, re, with the, um, the ability to purchase flood insurance uh, for their properties in the city of Grand Terrace. And um, the concern was that they were unable to purchase flood, flood insurance. And um, just want to clarify that um, Flood insurance can be purchased by Grand Terrace residents. However, um, through the National Flood Insurance Program, flood insurance can be purchased at a discounted rate. And so the real concern is that the insurance could not be purchased at the discounted rate. But what we're proposing before the council here is to, is to provide a, a solution to that. Um, so we're proposing an ordinance, and this ordinance would apply to all properties located in the special flood hazard areas for the city. With, located within the city. And in the staff report, we did provide an exhibit that showed that area in particular. It's essentially less than 40 acres in the city that has that designation. However, even though that's limited to 40 acres, with respect to the application of the ordinance, the community, there's a community-wide benefit, and that is that once we participate in this program, our community members can purchase insurance, flood insurance, at the discounted rate. This is a exhibit that was provided in the staff report. Uh, this, this line here is our, our Grand Terrace city limit. This zone AE is the area that has the special flood hazard designation, meaning it's subject to flooding. Um, and this is the area that this particular ordinance would be um, applicable to. I provided a aerial, and so again, we're talking about, this is the, the northerly boundary, there's a Santa Ana River, and so the AE zone comes roughly right, right around in this area. 
So with respect to implementation, the, the, um, once this ordinance is in place, the, any development within that area would be subject to particular provisions, and I just called out a few. It has to do with standards of construction, standards for utilities that get put in place, if subdivisions are proposed or some other type of development, um, these standards would come into play. Incidentally, this particular area is zoned floodplain industrial, so residential uses would not be uh, consistent with the zoning district. And then also the flood floodplain administrator would um, ensure compliance and provide reports to FEMA with respect to the implementation of the ordinance. So what we would ask the council to do, and my next slide will have a, um, the steps to the recommendation, but once this ordinance is adopted, we would then submit the application and the resolution and the urgency ordinance to FEMA. FEMA will fast track our application. We already have a community number in place. They are aware that we're trying to get this done quickly. And so um, they'll fast track it. Um, they'll give us the uh, go ahead that it's uh, in their system and then our, our community members can start purchasing flood insurance. And I say community members because renters can also purchase uh, insurance. So once the flood insurance uh, can be purchased at the discounted rate, th there is a policy um, restriction that it's, it's not effective for 30 days and so um, community members would have to wait 30 days. So what we are asking the council to do this evening is to adopt the resolution of intention to participate in the National Flood Insurance Program, adopt an urgency ordinance uh, pursuant to our health and safety code, adopting a floodplain management ordinance, and then also, um, as a matter of course, we also do a partnering regular ordinance adopting essentially the same ordinance. And so with that, I would um, conclude my presentation and I'll be happy to respond to any comments. Thank you. If we adopt this tonight, what does that do to the residential homes that are in that floodplain area? Um, Madam Mayor, thank you for asking. I did have an email from a member of the community, Mr. McConnell, um, asking about this ordinance and the properties in this area. Um, the properties and the structures that already are in there, in that area, um, would be allowed to continue. Uh, the application of this ordinance would come into effect if a substantial rehabilitation was proposed or if new development was proposed. Um, with respect to the existing structures, uh, these property owners potentially could also purchase flood insurance and uh, the rate would be whatever the rate is for purchasing within that flood zone. Okay. And, and are they currently able to purchase flood insurance in that area? Um, again, you don't know. our residents can purchase flood insurance. It's just not at, at the at, subsidized at the discounted rate. rate. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions of staff? Okay. I just have a comment. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Robles. Uh, you know, dealing with the county, um, we were doing some creative bond financing where we found because people weren't participating in this, they were paying like $638 for just flood insurance. So by bringing in um, this flood insurance, we were able to bring that down to like $200. So it can be quite significant. Um, so I was surprised when the gentleman came before us that we didn't, we didn't have this in place. Okay, thank you. Are there any requests to speak for us? Okay, so I will close public comment. Oh, I, oh, before I close public comment, I see somebody heading towards the, the lectern. Well, Mr. McConnell, that. please. I did thank fill you. out a slip. Thank you, Jeff McConnell, Walnut Avenue. Thank you for bringing this answering the uh, community's concerns and bringing this before the council. Now, if the council would please pass an ordinance restricting any El Nino floods <laughs> within the next 30 days, that'd be great. Um, I brought this before Sandra because uh, I have some FEMA maps and uh, I haven't been in real estate for almost 40 years now. Uh, one of the main things is disclose, disclose, disclose that we always like to uh, uh, make sure everybody does. <clears throat> Two of the properties, this affects five properties down there that's actually in Grand Terrace, not on the other side of La Cadena. Um, <clears throat> two of them have been for sale for many years. Um, the manhole build, infamous manhole builders have been sold for about 10, 11 years. And the, uh, the furthest most vacant property to the north is, was the Warner Hodgson's property. Yeah, he's passed away, but it's been for sale for quite some time too. 
So what I was trying to request the, the staff to, uh, the, to uh, disclose to those property owners, those five property owners down there, uh, not only that now that there is flood insurance at a, at a discounted um, um, amount, um, which is good news, but also the bad news about the, uh, the flood zone, the AE flood zone, uh, which affects all five properties to some degree uh, of the uh, re restricted, potential restricted uh, construction that they um, also have to be aware of. Because I'm sure, there's, I've, as you know, there's a lot of people, especially the last two who purchased the Manhole Builders property, but weren't, did not do their due diligence and have suffered great financial loss and lost six months of staff time here in the Planning Commission, which Mr. Wilson can attest to since he uh, resided over that battle. So <clears throat> I just think it might be uh, a precautionary measure for the staff just to uh, make them specifically those five parcels aware of the, those two items. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McConnell. Any other requests to speak at this time? Seeing no takers, I'll close public comment and come back to the staff for consideration of a motion. And I may remove approval for a uh, resolution of the City Council. City Grant Terrace declaring the City's intent of participation in the National Flood Insurance Program, authorizing application of participation in the National Flood Insurance Program, as well an urgency ordinance of the City Council of City Grant Terrace pursuant to Section 36937 of the California Code by adding a new chapter, Title 15, Building and Construction of the Grand Terrace Municipal Code for the Immediate Preservation of Public Peace, Health and Safety. And finally, uh, way further reading, an in an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Grand Terrace adding a new chapter to Title 15, Buildings and Construction of the Grand Terrace Mun Municipal Code. I'll second. Okay, I have a motion and second, and we have read by title. Um, Mayor, Council Member I, did, Wilson. I would just like to make uh, the community aware of the five parcels. When it says that you have to do uh, your construction in relation to the FEMA requirements, what that means generally is that you have to uh, you have to construct uh, your units above the floodplain. That means it, it either you either have to construct, uh, and this is if if the houses are dismantled or if there's a, a general subdivision or something like that. That means that you would have to uh, construct the foundations uh, probably at least one foot above the uh, floodplain height, and I believe it's probably a, a foot, which means it would be, have to be two feet, which means you'd have to uh, construct your units on a structural slab that would then be placed on a uh, stem wall that would allow the water to pass underneath the foundation or you would have to, to construct the stuff on uh, on piers. And the reason why that's important is because this is a, a, a standard situation that's taken place as a result of all the hurricanes and, and so on damage that has taken place and the uh, FEMA uh, does a broad brush approach to their solutions. And so far, uh, including the county of Los Angeles, county of San Diego, there hasn't been any new description on how that can be maybe s slightly reduced. So it's important for those five property owners to know that, uh, yeah, there is some good news, but there's also some liability there. Just wanted to read that into the record. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. So we have a motion and a second, and we read by title. Please vote. Motion passes five ayes. Council members Hussey, Wilson, Mitchell voted aye. Mayor Pro Tem Robles voted aye. Mayor McNabel voted aye. Thank you. We'll move to item 10, which is to consider elimination of the Community Development Department and create two new departments, Planning and Development Services, which would include Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement, and also the Department of Public Works to include Engineering, Streets Infrastructure, Public Works, Parks, and facility maintenance to consider approval of a new job classification and additional budget appropriations to support the new departments. May we please have a staff report? I wasn't here, thank you very much. For the record, G. Harold Duffy, the city manager. Um, so tonight we have, as the mayor said, several items on, on, for this packet. One is to adopt resolutions, approve job descriptions, rescind and adopt resolutions for new classifications classification salary range for employees, 
acknowledge that plan the planning, the new planning and public works directors are at will positions. Uh, direct the city manager to return within 90 days with municipal code changes relating to the separation agreements for uh, at will employees. And authorize the appropriation of $55,080 from the gas tax fund for increases in budget adjustments. So here's sort of how we need to look at this. So currently, the two primary positions that are affected in this are the community development director positions and the senior engineer. Uh, the current budget for the senior engineer fully funded with salaries and benefits is about $119,000. And the community development director position is $171,000. That's salaries and benefits. The proposed uh, total amount of current salaries is $291,388. The proposed changes that we're looking at is to have the uh, public works director, uh, which is also a registered uh, civil engineer, that salary would be $192,649. That is a salary and benefit. And as I said before, the uh, community development director position, the planning position would be $171,785. The primary difference between the community development director position and the planning director position is the, that's the middle step of the community development director position. Uh, this is the almost, of, it's the D of the E step for uh, the planning director position. So that total salary for those two combined new positions is $364,434. So there is a difference. There is a negative amount of $73,046. So how do we fill that gap? So the, the existing and new appropriation of, of gas tax. So currently, the community development director is being funded about 10% through gas tax funds, which is about $17,178. Those funds would be moved over to the public works director position because that position would be, would be uh, over all of those activities. In addition, that part of this report is asking the council to appropriate an additional $55,800 from our gas tax fund. That's how we fill the gap. Okay, so what does all this mean? What this really means for the city of Grand Terrace is we're able to brace ourselves for what we believe is going to be some very exciting times. So if you take the last decade, I'm talking about 2004, uh, I'm sorry, 2000, yeah, 2010 through 2020, we're looking at over a quarter of a billion dollars being invested into the city of Grand Terrace, starting with the $50, $50 million high school, the $100 million interchange, and the $100 million, <coughs> excuse me, uh, retail development uh, near, near the 215 freeway. So we need to prepare ourselves for that particular services. Currently, we have a community development department that has a director that's responsible for land use and public works throughout the entire city of Grand Terrace. That is public works, streets, sewer maintenance, uh, park maintenance, facilities maintenance, uh, planning, land use, planning commission, uh, uh, code enforcement, uh, all aspects of those primary functions of the city where um, really, the activity really occurs in how you build and move your city forward. So by splitting that community development director position into two positions, we will have a director of planning and development services, and that person will be responsible for all land use issues. One being, uh, and, the, and, and the organization would include the associate planner, or right, currently right now, the planning technician. It would include the building division, which would have a building official, and that would be a part-time building official. And the key for that position is currently we have a part-time building official on a consultant basis. And a significant component of building officials is doing plan check review. So currently under our contract with Wildan, more than 75% of the overall revenue from plan checking goes to the consultant and we keep 25%. By bringing the position in house, the city will keep all of those revenues. As you look at as part of how we plan on funding this, part of the process is by keeping those funds internally, we'll be able to uh, fund the, the part-time building official. 
In addition to that, we have administrative support of the department secretary. We also have code enforcement. And then when the, as part of the council's actions for quality of life enhancements, the council did approve funding for a weekend code enforcement officer that will assist in our code enforcement program. In addition to that, building officials usually have experience with code enforcement. So now you will be able to also increase your, not only your weekend service, but also increase your expertise with code, code enforcement through our, our building official. Next we move on to the public works department. So that we have a public works director. We previously had a senior engineer that was responsible for really helping coordinate and manage our, our public works activities. By elevating this level, uh, the city currently has a number of contracts with consultants, in addition to uh, having to look at regional issues and from a public works perspective and how that, how that impacts uh, the city of Green Terrace. By bringing forward a, a senior public works director, he will be able to handle the significant public work infrastructure issues as well as manage consultants on some of our significant projects. So the structure of the Public Works Department would look like this above. It would be a, a eventually, at some point in time, a civil a, a senior engineer, but the Public Works Director operates under that function. The administrative management analyst would move over to uh, the Public Works, Works Department. Uh, there would also be a GIS technician, uh, contractor. We also received a grant from uh, SCAG that allows us to use their GIS system. We also have a construction inspector uh, for particular pro public works projects. And we also have the public works field crews, also park maintenance crews, uh, and also working with Colton for our uh, maintenance of our, of our sewer system. So in addition, I, I mentioned this earlier, the additional positions we're adding are part-time building official. The city will end the existing contract with Wildan, which is about $26,000 for the employee to come uh, twice a week, and then also collect about $30,000 annually in plan check fees uh, for a total of about $56,000 to offset the $45,000 cost for the building official. And we expect that number to grow significantly as we move forward in, in our development process. In addition, we have the Weekend Code Enforcement Officer, and that funding was approved on October 27th by the Council using the 2014-15 uh, fund balance. So on April 28, 2015, the Council approved an ordinance number 281, which stated in 2.24.020 the applicability of chapter to all city officers and employees exception. This is dealing with the exempt employees. Currently, we have the department head prior to this department heads were considered uh, classified employees. Uh, when the council took the action on April 28th, they moved the classified employees uh, or vacant positions that are classified department heads to the at-will position. So in doing that, though, there are some employees, department heads, that are, uh, were hired before this uh, action took place. So they still have property rights, and they are still considered classified employees. In the particular case with our current community development director, uh, that employee would move over to the planning development services director position. Uh, and what this action is, is acknowledging that that particular position is at will, and it's directing the city manager to come back with some conditions that because uh, that particular person has rights, that they would then be given a, a three-month severance package if they were released for, without cause. Uh, and that's pretty standard when you release someone without cause to have a, have a condition like that. It also applies to uh, giving the city manager the ability to uh, have future new employees have a severance package up to three months but without cause. And so in summary, uh, Staff's recommendation is to uh, adopt the resolutions, approve job descriptions, rescind and adopt resolutions for new classified salary range for employees, acknowledge the planning and development and public works director are at will positions, direct the city manager to return within 90 days with the municipal code changes relating to separation agreements, and authorize the appropriation of $55,800 from the gas tax fund for increased and 
for increases in budget adjustments. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm available. Thank you. Any technical questions of staff at this time? Council Member Wilson? No? No, Mayor, I'd uh, like to move for approval. Okay. Do we have any requests to speak for this item? Okay, no. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second the motion. Okay, motion and second for staff recommendation. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Motion passes five ayes. Council members Hussey, Wilson, Mitchell voted aye. Mayor Pro Tem Robles voted aye. Mayor McNabel voted aye. Thank you. We are going to take a seven minute recess at this time.
Madam City Clerk, are you looking to see if we spent seven minutes? <laughs> okay, we'll, uh, we'll come back to our main session now and we'll resume with item number 11, which is the Economic Development Incentive Agreement with One Source Distributors. May we please have a staff report? Sure. Mr. Duffy. Yes. Um, yes, Mayor and Council. Um, this is an Economic Development Incentives Agreement with One Source Distributors. Uh, one source distributor is actually the city's largest sales tax generator. They approximately 25 to 30 percent of our of our total sales tax is generated from one source, and that used to be higher uh, several years ago. The proposal tonight will allow one source to stay in the, in the city of Grand Terrace. Well, one source was previously called ESCO, and ESCO was purchased by one source uh, and um, as part of the process one source uh, was left with a, a a lease that was four times above the market rate and so one source has been trying to find a new location sublet their current building and find a new location but one of the things that the council requested that I do when I first came on board was to try and, and ensure that we could Try and work something out with one source to remain in, in this in the city of Grand Terrace. So while they so what will happen is this agreement is well the, tonight I'm trying to get authorization to come back with an agreement to the council that would allow us to do an economic development incentive for 18 months uh, at a total cost of $180,000 uh, to the city uh, in in over the next 18 months. The goal here is to work with one source to build a new facility uh, in Grand Terrace. And also, uh, after that 18 months, we would receive 100% of our overall uh, sales tax, which we currently get. The total value of this in the program, as I said once before, is $180,000 over the next 18 months. The city keeps 50% of its current sales tax from one source. Uh, and this really is the equivalent, one source is the equivalent to, let's say, uh, at the current rate, about 10 McDonald's, or two grocery stores, or one and a half big, big box stores. Uh, and the great thing about one source is that the uh, traffic circulation issues are not the same impact if you had 10 McDonald's or two grocery stores jammed into one, one small space. They currently have uh, 16 employees that, that provide sales for all of California. Uh, and the majority of those employees are Grand Terrace residents. And so when I spoke with the president and the regional uh, VP, they indicated that they liked the Grand Terrace location. Uh, their business model has changed where they used to have a, they used to need a big distri distribution center. They've now moved to regional distribution centers, one in uh, Garden Grove and one in uh, San Diego. So they're looking for, they're looking to stay in Grand Terrace. Uh, they have already indicated that uh, they want to work with us to build a new facility, smaller facility, but that is consistent with their uh, reputation of being a $700 million company. So um, I'm very excited about the potential future here. Uh, they're ready to go, and so I'm looking, this recommendation is to get, have the council give me authorization to come to work out and develop an agreement and come back to the council with that, with that agreement. Thank you. Any questions of staff at this time? No? Okay. Do we have any requests to speak forms? No? All right. I will close public comment then and bring it back to council for consideration of a motion. Madam Mayor, move approval for the staff's recommendation. I will second. Okay, we have a motion and second. Please vote. Motion passes five ayes. Council members Hussey, Wilson, Mitchell voted aye. Mayor Pro Tem Robles voted aye. Mayor McNabo voted aye. Okay, thank you. And our last item on this is item 12. We'll adopt urgency ordinance and introduce a second ordinance amending Title 10 to add Section 10.04. Point four six two to the Grand Terrace Municipal Code. And we will have a staff report to tell us what that urgency ordinance will be and what Title 10 is that we will be amending. Thank you, Thank you Madam Mayor, members of the council. 
As indicated by the mayor, this is an urgency ordinance. Um, title 10. Title 10 is our um, streets and highways chapter or, or title of the municipal code. But um, so the, the reason why we brought this before the council is sometime last year, uh, about October, September, October, we, we met with um, our public works staff, we met with fire department, met with sheriff's department just to talk about in general El Nino and um, areas that may be of concern and then we just started talking about the volume of water that runs through our north south streets and primarily, particularly I should say, uh, Pico Street. Um, and one of the things we talked about is how when we have cars parked on the street, uh, the volume and velocity of water sometimes is such that once it hits the, the tires of those cars, it has a tendency to uh, jump the curb and then travel onto the adjacent properties along the, the roadways. And so uh, we had a discussion of whether it would, um, if we should consider not allowing parking uh, during these rain events. And so um, that's a discussion we've had in the past and then we also have had some concerns by residents about water that comes along the roadway and does just what, we, what I explained. And so um, what we're proposing is that the council adopt a um, urgency ordinance and again the partnering ordinance that would amend our municipal code to give the city manager the authority to um, establish temporary no parking uh, requirements for city streets. And the ordinance does not identify the streets in particular. Um, as in indicated in the report, we do have a concern on Pico. There are other street segments that we also may have concerns. Then we also may want to look at um, streets that where we have our storm inlets, whether we want to do something along uh, those areas as well. And so uh, we've, written the, we've written the ordinance that gives the uh, city manager the ability to do that. Uh, what we would do is we would monitor um, the uh, weather reports and where we anticipate significant rain, uh, the city manager would then direct uh, city staff to put up temporary no parking um, signs. And w the only slide I have here for the council, and it's kind of hard to see, but um, this is an aerial and what I have here is, is Pico Street. This is Mount Vernon, this is Pico Street, this is Michigan, and as the council has seen and is aware, there's a, a lot of water that just travels from the, from the foothills all the way down westerly. And sometimes we may get a little bit on our other north, south, excuse me, east, west streets. And so with that, um, Madam Mayor, members of the council, I'll conclude my presentation and I'm available to respond to any questions. Thank you. At this time, isn't there an opportunity to put up temporary no parking signs? There isn't really anything um, specific in our, in our municipal code. Um, typically when you put out no parking, uh, temporary no parking, there are, um, noticing requirements, so this would take care of that as far as letting us go ahead and, and do that when it's necessary to do so for health and safety reasons. Okay, thank you. Council, have any questions of staff? Nope. Okay. And do we have any requests to speak on this item? <coughs> All right. So I will open and then close public comment and bring it back to Council for consideration of a motion. I move the item. Second. Okay, it's been motioned and second. Uh, Madam City Clerk, will you read by title, please? Yes, ma'am. An urgency ordinance of the City Council of the City of Grand Terrace, California, pursuant to Section 36937 of the California Government Code by adding Section Section 10.04.462, temporary no parking to Title 10 of the Grand Terrace Municipal Code for the immediate preservation of the public peace, health, and safety. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Grand Terrace, California, adding section 10.04.462, temporary no parking to Title 10 of the Grand Terrace Municipal Code. Okay, thank you. The motion and second, please vote. Motion passes five ayes. Council members Hussey, Wilson, Mitchell voted aye. Mayor Pro Tem Robles voted aye. Mayor McNabo voted aye. Thank you. Okay, and we have a uh, item city manager communications on our agenda. Are there any communications, Mr. City Manager? Very briefly, Mayor, I uh, just wanted to remind the council and the public about the public input opportunity tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Uh, it's, it's the City of Grand Terrace Facility Naming Ad Hoc Committee meeting uh, in the Council Chambers uh, here. 
uh, and it will be regarding Pico Park and the potential renaming of Pico Park. Okay, thank you very much. The last item at closed session, we have no closed session tonight for our regular council meeting. So we're going to adjourn the city council meeting at this time, and we are, will be adjourning it in honor of Santos Robles Ruz. The next regular city council meeting will be held on Tuesday, January 26, 2016 at 6 p.m. Agenda item requests must be submitted in writing to the city clerk's office no later than 14 calendar days preceding the meeting. Thank you all for your attendance and for your comments. And um, we will at this time reconvene the Housing Authority meeting. And so we will start off with public comment. If there are any comments for this particular meeting, I see no takers. So we'll close public comment and we'll come back to uh, approval of minutes. So we have minutes from the That's true. The last time we had this, we just set it up. So we have no minutes to approve. And we have no unfinished business, but we do have new business, which is a housing successor financial report for the year ended June 30th, 2015. May we have that report, please. Uh, good evening, Chairperson, uh, Chairperson McNabo, Vice Chair and Board Members. My name is Cynthia Fortune uh, from the Finance Department. And I need my PowerPoint presentation. Presentation tonight is to submit the Grand Terrace Housing Authority, the Housing Successor Financial Statements for the year ended June 30th, 2015. This staff report supports City Council goal number one, ensuring our fiscal viability through continuous monitoring of revenue receipts and expenditure disbursements against approved budget appropriations. On January 30th, 2012, City Council established the Grand Terrace Housing Authority. The Grand Terrace Housing Authority assumed the housing functions and assets of the former redevelopment agency. California Health and Safety Code Section 34176.1 requires the preparation of financial statements for redevelop redevelopment housing successor agencies, and these statements were to include an independent auditor's report, statements relating to revenues, expenditures, and fund balance, and submission of, of these financial statements to the agency's governing body. The independent audit report uh, or the independent financial audit of the housing successor agency was prepared by Lance Saul Lungard, the city's independent auditors. The independent auditors report, uh, their opinion letter is referred to as unqualified. This means that the financial statements of the housing successor for the year ended June 30th, 2015, fairly represent the agency's financial position in accordance with accounting principles generally accepted in the United States. So for the statement of activities, um, as you can see, uh, fund balance at the beginning of the year was roughly 1.9 million. We received revenue of $20,000. Um, that was one of uh, the, uh, one of the uh, loans we have outstanding that they paid for. Uh, the expenditure uh, you see for $5,600, that is actually the cost for the preparation of the report for the audit and the report. That will leave us an ending balance of $1,942,277. So what we wanted to do is also give um, the authority a breakdown, a breakdown of our fund balance. Notes and loans, I believe um, all the definitions are explained as part of the attachment of the report, but these are all the one time, first time home buyer or rehab, rehab second trust loans that were given out to low and moderate um, household income families. Uh, we have land held for sale, and we have three properties. At one point, uh, the general fund actually took out a loan from our low and, mo low and moderate housing fund, tune of $168,000. And um, so much are restricted for uh, low and moderate housing activities. And I believe that number is incorrect. It should have been roughly 408,000. 
but technically that is still also uh, an amount that is due from the successor agency. So um, for those who've actually read our statement, the actual amount of cash that the authority has on hand is roughly, at the end of the year, was roughly $37,000. Uh, that concludes my report, and again, this is a receive and file by the uh, authority. If, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Yeah. Do the board members have any questions of staff? No, nope. hearing none. I'm going to move to accept the report. Second. Okay. Motion and second, please vote. Motion passes, five ayes. Authority board members Hussey, Wilson, Mitchell voted aye. Vice Chair Robles voted aye. Chair McDougall voted aye. Thank you. We have no public hearings for this body and we have an opportunity for board member reports. Do any of the board members um, have reports that they'd like to give this evening? Okay, seeing none. We will move on to our closed session item. We will recess to closed session, which is a conference with real property negotiators. Pursu pursuant to government code section 54956.8 and we will be discussing property APN number 1167-231-01 and APN number 1167-311-01. Agency negotiator will be G. Harold Duffy, authority director. Negotiating parties are Arizona Properties and Lewis Group and under negotiation is price in terms of payments. We will at this time recess to close session. Okay. Before we recess to close session, are there any requests to speak on this item? Okay. Please state your name for the record. Jeff McConnell, Walnut Avenue. I understand all about low and mod because I go to all these hearings all the time and other developments in town that propose low, low, um, low subsidized housing in town, you know, is a hot topic. If you want to fill this room up with a bunch of angry people, just propose a uh, low income apartment building on those properties. That's one way to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McConnell. Any other, any others wishing to speak on this item before we recess? Okay, see, no takers will close public comment and recess to our closed session. Thank you.
board met in closed session with real property negotiators. We gave direction to staff and there are no reportable actions at this time. So with that, we will adjourn. The next regular housing authority meeting will be scheduled as needed. Agenda item requests must be submitted in writing to the city clerk's office no later than 14 calendar days preceding the meeting. And so, um, as needed, <laughs> submit those items. And thank you all for your participation tonight. Thank you to my colleagues. Thank you to staff. And we are adjourned. <laughs>